Jim Lutz, W6 RMK, is our guest speaker, and he's got a wonderful program on the NASA uh, Interferometer Space Experiment, the Sunrise Project. So, Jim, go ahead and take over. Okay. Um, let me just uh, share it here. And so, are we all seeing it uh, full screen properly there? Yes. Yep. All right. So um, a little background is um, I've been at JPL about 25 years now, and uh, most of that time I was in the section that builds flight radios. So that's the radios that go on the spacecraft as opposed to the ones on the ground of the DSN. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of us other hams in that section as well. But recently I've been... Um, running missions and this mission is called sunrise and uh, this presentation was put together by joe lazio who's a radio astronomer but also the chief scientist for the deep space network um, justin casper at the university of michigan is our uh, principal investigator and he's a uh, solar scientist and uh, andres romero wolf is the deputy project scientist and Tim Nielsen is the project manager at Space Dynamics Lab, who is actually building the spacecraft. We're built, we built the radio. This is the spacecraft actual size. Um, the Space Dynamics Lab, we built the radios at JPL, and um, SDL is building the spacecraft, putting it all together, and then it will launch on a rocket in 2024. So I'll mention that later. So why do we want to go into space to look at the sun? So it turns out that one problem is that we really don't know much about how the sun works internally. Uh, you know, we know it has sunspots. Everybody who's a ham hears about that. But it also has flares and coronal mass ejections. Uh, and so one of the things that lets people know that the scientists can use to figure out what's going on with the sun um, is to look at the radio emissions that come out with these things like coronal mass ejection. So a coronal mass ejection is when the sun burps out uh, an enormous amount of mass. Uh, our PI calls it the, you know, the mass of Lake Michigan, uh, which makes sense to him being in the University of Michigan. For us in Southern California, I don't know what, Lake Tahoe or something like that. Um, Anyway, so we want to know about that. And one of the cool things about these sorts of solar activities is, is that the sun is moderately noisy and these bursts generate these uh, waveforms, uh, you know, this noise burst that falls in frequency as it moves away from the sun. So the change in frequency has to do with the density of the solar atmosphere. Um, just like you know, the ionosphere has a critical frequency, and as the ionosphere is denser, the critical frequency uh, changes. Same thing in the sun. So when you're close to the sun, the frequency is high, and as this burst moves, as the source moves away from the sun, the frequency gradually falls. So there are two kinds of bursts we're looking at. There's type two and type three bursts. Type two bursts are the slower ones here. They're the ones associated with a coronal mass ejection. Type three bursts happen all the time. Um, they're not entirely sure what they're caused by, but they also do know that there are never coronal mass ejections unless they have type three bursts before them. And just so you get an idea of the time scale here, this type two burst lasts, so you can see it's about four hours. And um, so the way we do this, so the question that the scientists have is what's going on inside this coronal mass ejection because the little white circle here that's the sun this is from a coronagraph in orbit um, this is the obscuring thing so you can see that this coronal mass ejection is pretty good size the blob the bright blob here is bigger than the sun so it's it's huge um, <coughs> so it turns out there are at least four theories for what's going on inside uh, these coronal mass ejections. Uh, you know, this is one of those classic things where if you have uh, uh, 10 
astrophysicists or heliophysicists in a room and you ask them, they'll have about 20 opinions. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but it, one idea is, that, OK, you have this huge mass heading out from the sun and there's a it turns out there's a shock wave at the front. And we know that shock and the compression can cause radio emissions. Um, but maybe it's as this thing expands on the sides, maybe that's where the radio waves are coming from. And that's where the acceleration really is. And then it turns out that there's another theory that says, well, you know, as this thing goes out, the sun's got a strong magnetic field. You're moving part charged particles in a magnetic field. That makes a current just like in an antenna. And it's really the return current coming back down here is where the radio is coming from. And now we know these, these bursts ex exist like these because we've got satellites in orbit that can see them, but they're only a single satellite. So they don't know where it's coming from. It's just a dipole in space and it records these signals. Um, so what we're going to do with sunrise is we're going to actually image the radio emissions from the sun. Um, oh, by the way, there's the fourth, uh, there's the fourth model, uh, which is that uh, the radio emissions are coming from somewhere totally different, and it has nothing to do with this, the parts of the CME. Um, so what we want to do is we want to look at the coronal mass ejection. So here are some images from a coronagraph, that's the black and white, and lined up with uh, data from wind waves, uh, which is out at about the orbit of its... Um, I think wind waves is one of those uh, uh, out of the Earth, Sun, L4, 5. Um, anyway, it's farther away than the moon. Um, <laughs> so you can see this burst here. And the question is, is, is it localized? And we've done, um, they've done research with, this is a radio image taken at, um, no, this is actually a chronograph, but there's a radio source on this taken from, uh, a radio telescope in France at about 80 megahertz. So, you know, these things, the, the burst starts way up high and then falls down. So you're saying, well, you know, why don't we just use that radio telescope? So we're all hams. We all okay. like to use HF. So it turns out that the same ionosphere that makes it possible to work skywave to Europe blocks the view of the sun's emissions at 10 and 20 megahertz, right? You know, here we are at 10 megahertz, you know, today I'll bet you can't see the sun at 10 megahertz because the ionization has been good enough recently because of the sunspots to completely, the, essentially it's a mirror for us. So we have to observe this from in space. Um, and here's an example. Here's a, uh, this is the, this is a chronograph image on the background. This is the emissions detected at 80 megahertz. And here's the, sort of the CME coming out. So what we're gonna do with sunrise is we're gonna see it when it gets out past here, out into this region here. And um, this is where the heliophysicists think the interesting stuff is going on. So that's sunrises of great interest to the uh, heliophysics community. Um, well, this looks like a duplicate. Um, okay, so here. So let's talk about, so we wanna make images. We want to talk about angular resolution. Um, so, you know, the bigger your antenna, the smaller the beam, the better resolution you get. Uh, here is Arecibo, which is 300 meters across. doesn't look quite like that anymore since the cables broke. Um, but it turns out that if you look at uh, our signals, which have like 100 meter wavelengths, um, you know, that that's... Uh, three megahertz. And uh, we actually are recording all the way down to 100 kilohertz to 26 megahertz, 23 megahertz. Um, you know, we need a diameter, it's about six kilometers. <laughs> so <clears throat> we need a six kilometer re, uh, antenna in space. And, you know, while, while JWST is an impressive feat, it's nowhere near six kilometers. <laughs> um, but we have an advantage. Uh, the sun's really, really bright. Uh, these uh, signals are something like 40 dB over the noise floor. So we don't need to have a completely filled aperture. Um, we can have a sparse aperture. In fact, what we have is we're going to have six satellites that are in a, co a constellation that's about 
10 kilometers across. So that gives us our resolution. The sun's really bright, so we'll see it above the noise floor. We'll be able to generate our images, um, which is you know pretty cool. And so this is all done with a technique called interferometry. Uh, so for instance, uh, next spring, we're gonna be doing what's called the uh, interferometer level performance test. We're gonna take all six spacecraft, put them on a bench, feed them artificial signals and see if it works before we launch them. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, so there's, to do interferometry, and, and interferometry has been done uh, for what, 80 years now. Um, and in fact, uh, somebody won a Nobel prize for figuring it out. What you do is you record the signals at two different places or more, and you very, and you combine them by multiplying them together you know, in a mixer. And, and by doing that, you can measure the phase difference between the, the, when the signals arrived at the two antennas. And from that, you can know what direction it came in. Because, you know, the wavefront coming in as a plane wavefront. And uh, then as a, uh, when you, if you know the timing difference, then you can say what direction it's coming from. So how do we know with these six spacecraft, what time it is? Well, we have a GPS receiver. And uh, some of you may have uh, GPS disciplined oscillators or GPS controlled clocks in a radio. So the GPS gives us essentially uh, remote access to an atomic clock that's very accurate. So we actually record the HF signals, 100 kilohertz to 23 megahertz, and we timestamp them with this uh, GPS clock to an accuracy of about a nanosecond. The GPS does something else is it allows us to know precisely where each of these satellites are because, you know, uh, distance is time. So when we do the calculations, we need to know exactly where it is. And it allows us to know where they are within about a foot um, in post-processing. So here is the actual uh, receiver. So the entire spacecraft, you know, it's, you know, it's basically, uh, you know, 30 centimeters tall, a little more than a about a foot by eight inches by four inches. And the, let me see if my cursor disappeared here. Hang on just a second, because otherwise I can't point to anything. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So uh, this box and these uh, antennas, which are a boom antenna that springs out when we're on orbit, all kind of fits in the bottom mm, four inches or so, or three and a half inches of this tw uh, 12 inch long box. You know, looking at my model here, it's about this much. Um, so we've got two dipoles that are crossed. So we have four boom antennas sticking out. Those are called stacers. A couple of little preamps. Here's our GPS stuff. And there's a board inside that has all the electronics. And here's a picture of it sitting on the bench. Um, so you can see inside here, this box right here, that's the ovenized crystal oscillator. We do need an oscillator inside. What we do is we measure that oscillator against GPS. And that oscillator does the sampling clock because we're measuring it all the time. We know exactly what its frequency is. It's a pretty good oscillator at you know, one part per billion per day kind of aging and it's ovenized, but we need to know, remember one nanosecond. So that's, um, uh, you know, for a 50 megahertz oscillator, the period is 20 nanoseconds. So we need to know what the uh, frequency of the oscillator is quite precisely. Here's the uh, housings for the stacer antennas. So imagine these things are about four inches long and they have a two and a half meter long boom, call it 10 feet, that mm -hmm. it pops out when we uh, are on, on orbit. And then here are some preamps, the wires to the preamps and all the circuitry installed. There's um, here it is uh, getting ready to be tested in a thermal chamber. Uh, it turns out that the, you know, since we need to know time really accurately and the signals, it turns out that the GPS electronics, uh, particularly the bandpass filter and the LNA has a temperature coefficient of oh, 40 picoseconds per degree. So uh, when you're, when you care about tenths of a nanosecond, 40 picoseconds is a big chunk. So what we do is we put it in the chamber and we test it over temperature and then we can actually measure that. And then we put that into a calibration table. 
Um, here it is sitting on a bench to it looking for EMI. Uh, this is kind of an interesting process. The you know, historically for spacecraft, um, you know, you, you've got like, for instance, the Artemis one mission that launched last night, you know, all those little CubeSats have X band. So that's at eight gigahertz and seven gigahertz. So, you know, okay, you worry about interference there. You worry about interference with your GPS from processor clocks. Here we're measuring down around, as far as the rest of the world's concerned, DC, under 30 megahertz. And that's a place where there's all kinds of things like switching regulators that make noise. Uh, anybody who's operated HF, you know, RFI is something we always have to worry about. All Fluorescent lights, whatever else. Now, there aren't any fluorescent lights out in space to worry about. Uh, there aren't any uh, DC to DC. There aren't any uh, noisy wall warts, but we do have our self to worry about. So our, we have to be very, very quiet. So we've tested that. Uh, here was, they're getting ready to test the Stacer. They have the little unit here and they have a camera watching it. Uh, let me see if I can, if this will play. So here they are and you watch. And what they do is this, this has a bolt in it that has a heater and boom, there it goes. I'm going to see that again. Here we'll go. So the, the stacer is spring-loaded. It's held inside this canister. And then there's a little bolt that when it gets hot, um, it's a shape membrane alloy, and it actually fractures the bolt, and then the, the stacer can shoot out. So here we go again. Um, come on. There it's running. Bang. So when we get into space, We'll get in our orbit that we want to be in, and then we'll send a command to the spacecraft saying, basically, heat the bolts, and it'll shoot two of them out, and then half hour later, it'll shoot the other two out. And, and uh, these things are really, really reliable. They've uh, flown hundreds of them uh, and never had a failure in space. They've had some failures on the ground, but not in space, and that's where it really counts. Um, Okay, so what's the inside of the spacecraft look like? So what we got is, remember this is, uh, if those of you that are familiar with the CubeSat world, this is what's called a 6U. Um, 1U is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Um, that was invented at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Stanford. Uh, it turns out that's the size of the plastic box that Beanie Babies come in, is where the 1U <laughs> came from. <laughs> and so the very first little cube sats were truly a cube. Then they made two U's and three U's. My my previous cube sat was a that I launched at JPL was a three U. This is a six, so it's two by three. So it's you know thirty centimeters this direction and twenty centimeters this way and ten centimeters thick. It's actually a little bit bigger because um, the dispenser it goes inside is a little bit bigger and. Uh, one thing you're always looking for on a spacecraft is more room. Um, it is kind of the 10 pounds and a five pound sack problem. But here we are. So at this end of the spacecraft, we've got a propulsion system. And here's a little picture of it here. So that has um, six valves in it and it's uh, got Freon in it. And then when we want to change the orientation or change the orbit, we pulse those valves open and it squirts a little bit out of these nozzles which point in different directions. And so we can use that to, to push the spacecraft in a direction and then also to rotate it if we have to. There are some uh, reaction wheels inside the attitude control system that spin up, but you can't, they only have a certain amount of, when you, when you make the wheel spin, it makes the spacecraft turn the opposite direction, but there's a limited amount of that. So you have to, what they do, desaturate the wheels and the propulsion system does that. Solar arrays, that's pretty standard, about 27 watts all told. Uh, got a little stack, uh, avionics stack here. That's the uh, flight computer and all the <clears throat> power switches for everything. Got a lithium ion battery here. There's uh, three little cells. So we're running on a bus voltage of around 10 to 12 volts, depending on the state of charge. There's a... Uh, telecom radio from InnoFlight in here. This is, uh, we get our commands on S-band around two gigahertz and we send our data down on X-band at 8.4 uh, 8 gigahertz. And um, so that's that. 
Um, I would have loved to have built that radio myself, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and here's, here's a picture of the battery, and this is the attitude control system. The attitude control system is kind of cool. It has the wheels in it, which rotate the spacecraft, but it also has this hole here is a, what's called a star track. It's a star tracker. It's a camera and it looks at the sky. And what it does is, is it matches up the stars it sees against an internal star map. And that's how it knows what direction it's pointed. Now it doesn't know where it is, but it knows what its attitude is. And so with the combination of that and the GPS, it knows where it is and what direction it's pointed. And so then we can say, point the spacecraft to this place on earth or point the spacecraft towards the sun, which is its normal uh, operation. Um, so these have all been built up. There's um, six of these spacecraft. They're all sitting in Logan, Utah. We just finished a test with the deep space network to ensure that the radios can talk to the deep space network. Now we don't actually talk to the big dish out of Goldstone or in Australia or Spain. What they do is they have a whole DSN station in our semi-trailer that they drive out and they pulled that out to Logan, Utah. And we spent a month running tests to show that we could actually communicate. Um, so that's there. Um, here we are doing some testing. There's the avionics stack on a vibe table. Um, you know, this thing's going to go into space on a rocket. You know, once it's in space, th this is one of the things that that kind of some people don't really appreciate fully is that it's not being in space that's the harsh environment. In actuality, being in space, it's pretty benign, right? There's no vibration. The sun shines on you. You can make sure you point the right direction. You don't get too hot or too cold. Yeah, you have some radiation, but you can solve that. And in, in low Earth orbit, I mean, People live on ISS at 400 kilometers and the radiation there is pretty small. Um, so, you know, it's the ride up there. <laughs> That's the hard part. You know, you get on a rocket and uh, you, you're going to see these, you know, 10 G vibration for about a minute and then <clears> it's <throat> quiet. And so you got to survive that. So we vibe all the stuff and then we test it over temperature. Uh, here they are checking out the solar panels under a solar simulator. Um, and this this is the uh, power controller. So we have a maximum PowerPoint tracker kind of thing to optimize talking to the solar panel. It turns out that this is actually one of the dominant noise sources for a lot of satellites. And the reason is, is that uh, because you want high efficiency, you've got a switching power supply that draws current from the solar panel. And what it does is it changes the apparent load impedance to be at the absolute best voltage current. You know, there's a curve for the solar panel, depending on how much sun is falling on it, of where you, what load you want to present. And so they have these switching converters to do that. The problem is, is that all that switching converter, those switching transients are being distributed over the whole solar panel. So it acts like an antenna. So we uh, fortunately have tested that. That will not be a problem for us. We've carefully shielded things um, and here we are with the uh, some batteries in a thermal test chamber. Eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to put the entire spacecraft into a vacuum chamber for a week, and we're going to run it down to cold temperatures. We'll run up to hot temperatures and a bunch of temperatures in between, and we'll show that uh, it still works. Uh, here it is getting built up. This is what we call the protoflight. This was the very first spacecraft. So, you know, if you think about it, you want to do a trial assembly. So we put everything in it. Uh, put We have an engineering model payload here. These are the actual stacers on it. Uh, we wire it up. We slide everything in there. And then we put it in and we go through a vibration test and a, uh, and a thermal vacuum test. And we confirm that all of our assumptions and design was correct. And then we're going to take this one. We took this one apart. And we'll put the real payload in and the real things instead of models. And we have five more that we're building up and uh, have built uh, and that will go into test. So any questions so far before I get into orbits and things like that? I'll have some towards the end. Okay. 
All right. Was that a question? No. Okay. Um, all right. So, so I'm going to show a little video here, and this kind of shows how we orbit the sun and how we actually do the interferometry. So we're in an orbit that's about 300 kilometers above geostationary. So essentially, we don't move very fast relative to the Earth. You know, we slowly drift around the Earth every three months. There are six of us, and uh, they all have names, Faye, Spike, Bebop, Edward, Ein. Um, and they're, they're all in the same orbit almost. And they're just slightly different. And so relative to each other, they kind of make these figure eights. But the key thing is, is that the distance between all of them is controlled. So we have some that are close, but not too close. We don't want to run into each other. And we have some that are farther apart because farther apart gives you better resolution. So here they are all flying. And remember, the sun's on the other side. This, this gray disk is essentially a plane that is perpendicular to the direction of the sun. It's normal to the solar direction. And we take the signals that we record in each of these spacecraft and we combine them. And that forms what's called a baseline, an interferometry. So each baseline can tell you the direction from which the radio emissions are coming in the angle that's along the baseline, but can't tell you anything about crossways. But if you have two baselines that are crossed or a bunch of baselines like here, then when you combine them all, you've got this direction and that direction and all the other directions in between with various resolutions and you can actually form the image. And that's, that's what's cool. And that's actually what's done on the ground. So all the spacecraft have to do is record the signals and know what time it is. Mm -hmm. um, so our design, what they do is they, they've designed the orbits so that, and this circle is the 10 kilometer diameter we want. And you can see on here that there's always some lines that are longer than the length we need and that are crossing. And there's also a bunch of shorter ones. And it turns out that we actually don't need six. We can actually do all of our science with five. So essentially we have a spare unit on orbit. We'll run it because we get better data if we have six. But if one of them dies, and one probably will, I mean, it's it's a year in space, to, you know. Um, you know, we still get all of our science data. And in fact, we can even get fairly good science data with only four. It's just that sometimes, if you imagine, if they all lined up in a line, you'd have lots of baselines, but they're all going in the same direction. So you'd only your image would only be have high resolution in one axis and wouldn't have the other. And so sometimes that can that's more likely to happen if you have fewer. If you could accurately control the relative positions of all the spacecraft, you could do it with as few as three, fly them in a triangle. And you, you've got enough baselines there to make it work. The problem is, is that then you have to really accurately control the spacecraft. And, what's, and that's hard to do. What we've got here is a system where we need knowledge, but we don't need control. So all we have to do is keep them, yeah, half a kilometer, kilometer, 10 kilometers apart. Don't run into each other. And we can kind of let them go where they will as the orbits evolve because, you know, the sun shines and the gravitational fields change and the moon's gravity moves them. So they all kind of get perturbed. And once a week, we kind of nudge them a little bit to make sure they're in the right orbit. And uh, and as long as they, the constellation is covered, then we're in good shape science-wise. Any questions? Yeah, a two-part question. Uh, okay. Is, uh, how much Freon is each one? One of these contain oh, um, about 400 grams, 350 grams. And so, um, lifespan. no, no, no. Our, our Delta V, is, our total Delta V budget is around seven meters per second. Um, and we, and we use about a half to a third of that just getting into our orbit. So now we ride this other rocket up and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. We get pushed out of a canister at about a half a meter a second. And then we do a couple maneuvers consuming a couple meters per second. And then after that, it's just this one year of gentle nudges and desats and things like that. So um, if, if we do this, you know, sort of probabilistically, right? A 99th percentile bad, uh, we have enough propellant on board to go for 18 months. 
and our mission is 12 months. We have a, it's actually 14. We have a, a month of commissioning on the front end, 12 months of operation, and then a month at the end to cover times if something went wrong and we need to still get enough data. Um, okay, so that's that. That's the first part of your question is uh, 350 grams, a little less than you know, three quarters of a pound. Yeah. Was there another question? If Omar is in the building, please come to the circulation desk. Omar, thank you. Just a public announcement from the uh, facility. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, here's how we get to orbit. Now, this is actually a little out of date because our ride changed, but it's still pretty much the same. So originally we were planning on riding on a commercial communication satellite up to GEO. So the way these commercial satellites work, and this one's from Maxar, there's a bunch of these, and they've launched, I don't know, 50 of them. They boost them up to a little bit above or below GEO, and then they drift along until they're at the right place longitude-wise, then they put them down into the geostationary orbit where it's going to live for the rest of its mission. So during that drifting along period, they would push us out. Now, it turns out that, that this didn't quite pan out. They didn't have a ride at the right time or anything else. So now we're going to ride on a, uh, a rocket that's being launched by the U.S. Space Force that's carrying a whole bunch of payloads to GEO. They're going to do the same thing. So we, we launch. Um, actually, they have enough Delta V on their launch vehicle to... They don't need to phase it. They just uh, direct up to geosynchronous and then they'll drop us off. And you can see in this picture over here, see these little six canisters here. These are like a box that just fits uh, the spacecraft inside and has a spring and a door. And so when we get to the right place, they open the door, the spring pushes us out and we're flying. We have to wait about 45 minutes before we can turn on because they don't want us to turn on power and well, we can turn the power on and boot the computer, but we can't, they don't want us to do any propulsive maneuvers. Uh, they don't want us to uh, deploy anything just in case we're still close to the host because the worst thing would be for us to get kicked out of the host and then break something on a billion dollar <laughs> telecom satellite. So they kick us out. At about a half a meter a second, we got to wait 40 minutes. So that we're, by that time, we're about a kilometer away, and then we're free to do whatever we want with our spacecraft, and uh, their job is done. Um, they're going to push us out about every 15 minutes on the launch we're on. So we're going to launch, and then we come out kind of like a Pez dispenser. Boop, 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 boop. And, uh, and meanwhile, there's a, a bunch of people on the ground who are trying to make contact with them, uh, you know, one at a time from the DSN. So we'll have the DSN tracking, you know, pointed at the right place in the sky. Uh, the DSN beam at, at our altitude is about 40 kilometers wide. So we need to know where we are within that. We actually will know where we are within probably five or 10 kilometers. And so we have, we'll make contact and all those uh, senior managers standing in the back of the room going, are we there yet? Are we there? Have we made contact yet? Is it working? They can say, yes, it is. We're good to go. And so we'll do that six times over the course of about, probably about four or five hours all told. We'll get them all kind of stabilized. We'll see that they're working and we'll give them their initial push on their way. Then they'll sit for a day collecting GPS data, which will then downlink. And now we'll know exactly where they are and our navigators can build the first maneuvers to put them into the orbits they need. Um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, there's, you have a, a lot of things in space are you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, and then it's really, really, really busy for a short time. Um, you know, so it'll be busy for that launch day and about two weeks after that, and then we'll get them all deployed and operating. And um, then we'll, uh, you know, go back. Then we'll be just in, in normal science collection mode. We talk to them once a week. So they just sit out there collecting data 24 seven pointing at the sun because you don't know when these coronal mass ejections are gonna occur. So they just are always observing, always collecting data. They all they have GPS, so they all sample at the same time. And then we 
you know, once a week, we bring all that data down. It's about 20 gigabits a week that we bring down per spacecraft. Um, so there's six of them, and then that gets fed off to a processing center at University of Michigan where it gets turned into the images. So here's kind of what's going on. Here's kind of what we, we have. Now, these are simulations running on our science pipeline where Alex Hedgedis, uh, who, is a, who got his PhD doing this, created simulations of different emission sources. And the circles, the size of the circle is the resolution we'll have for the image. So let me see if I can get this to restart here. Come on. Here it goes. So you can see the CME is, is moving and this bright spot is moving. And this is the, the, the one in the front. Here's the flank. And you can see, so as we move away from the sun, our resolution gets worse. Why? Lower frequency, longer wavelength. Resolution is all about the ratio of the wavelength to the baseline length. So, you know, but still the resolution is pretty good. Uh, the sun is, you know, half a degree wide when you, by the time you get out to here, the, the image resolution is probably a couple of degrees, which is still pretty good. Um, yeah. So um, this was an original schedule slide uh, here, you know, um, just to kind of a little backup is, you know, um, the building of the spacecraft is kind of a frenzy, uh, but the lead up to it is a lot longer. Uh, so way back in 2016, that's when NASA said, hey, we would like missions of opportunity to study interesting stuff for heliophysics, and it has to cost less than $50 million. And um, there are other bigger classes in that same call. So we, we wrote a proposal for that uh, in October. And so at that stage, the NASA is evaluating the proposals and they're saying, is this something that the scientists want? Because, you know, they got a, a certain amount of money to farm out to all the various projects, the missions. Um, you want to do things which are scientifically valuable. I mean, all the proposals are scientifically interesting, but what you want to do is align them and, and hopefully have a, you know, that this heliophysics uh, mission and other heliophysics missions and the heliophysics community in general thinks that this is a good idea. You know, they have a thing called the decadal study that comes out every 10 years where the heliophysics and the astrophysics community, and uh, there's also one for earth science, come out and say, the scientific community thinks that this would be good ideas. So we submitted, they said, good idea. That proposal also had to have a design and the cost estimates and everything else and could be pretty sketchy at that point. And then we got selected in 2017, which was remarkably quick. And then um, we basically had a year to put together a more detailed design and a plan for what they call the concept study board, which is also called a step two. Um, you know, now I should point out that in reality, NASA's, NASA pays you a little bit of money to do these concept study reports, about a, half, about a half a million dollars, but we actually didn't get that until September or something like that. So it was kind of a pretty busy six months getting that compact uh, study out. So that's kind of like another proposal process. And uh, we delivered that. They come out and do a site visit and they grill you for a day uh, with questions. And then in February of 19, so now here we are, remember it's three years after the AO came out. We finally, we thought, ah, they're gonna announce. And they said, well, we're not ready to quite select you yet. We'd like you to spend another year putting together uh, more, more information. And so here we are with this extended phase A concept study report in September 19. They, they said, oh, that's great. And then uh, in, 2020 in June, we actually started working on it. And so that that's when we actually stood up the project, started getting serious design work going, uh, did all of our preliminary designs. And then phase C, uh, which is when you actually start uh, implementation, it was um, basically two years ago. Um, well, actually, about a year ago, right? 
right, Labor Day weekend um, in uh, 21. So right now this says no earlier than 2023. It turns out our launch is actually going to be in 2024. So what's going to happen is we're going to work and we're going to build all those spacecraft. We're going to test them. And then next May, we're going to put them into storage. And then they'll just sit in storage until about three months before launch. We'll pull them out of storage, ship them to the launch provider. They'll put them on the rocket and the rocket will go into space and we'll all be doing stuff. And that is Sunrise. So any questions? I've got plenty of other slides that I can show you if you want them, but, you know. Um, well, I have a practical question. Once you place all this hard work into storage for a few weeks, uh -huh. out of storage, do you not need to do some kind of assessment to determine that nothing happened to it? Well, it um, well there's two things we'll do. Um, we, we have to check the batteries and make sure they're still charged. And in fact, we'll probably check that every six months. And the other thing we have to do is make sure the propellant hasn't leaked out. Um, you know, it's it's a plumbing system. It's pretty complex. It's got lots of fittings. Um, stuff leaks. We know the leakage is quite low, uh, one milligram per day. Uh, and so, but if it sits in storage for a year and a half, then we may have to put more propellant in it. But other than that, um, no, we've, this is a pretty common thing. We don't have to do a complete test. We're not going to do, for instance, we're not going to turn the spacecraft on and verify that it works. We'll just assume it does. Well, you have no reason to doubt that it wouldn't. <laughs> it just meant that there potentially yeah. could be some change that I, yeah. I'm not in your field. I don't know what that might what was that? What was that again? I'm saying I believe you have no reason to not trust that it would work. And I'm not in your field, so I'm just thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, on yeah. the practical side of life, for months, something could change. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a certain amount of nervousness, um, but you know, um, space stuff takes a long time to happen, even in space. And so, for instance, if you're flying to Look at Cassini, you know, it flew to Jupiter and Saturn and everything else. And it takes, it took six years. And so there's a whole lot of stuff on there that's just going to sit for six years until they turn it on when it, they need it. Um, you know, yeah, we're, we're pretty comfortable that if it makes it through the fairly rigorous test process before we put it into storage, we're sure it's going to turn on um, when, it, when it gets on orbit. Okay, and another practical question. In terms of staffing, you have a fair amount of time that you show us in that chart. So do people yeah. involved with this change? Uh, your, uh, I couldn't quite hear you. Was you asking about? Uh, you're in the back of the room. It's kind of echoing. Yeah, since, since you have uh, such a long duration of this program, does the staffing change and are they working on other projects? Or? Yes. Well, mm, yes, that's always a risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah, uh, this is a classic problem. Uh, what we've done is that it turns out that most of the people working on this project, so the people who build the spacecraft, when we go into storage, they're done, Right. All they have to do is get the technicians out, you know, a year later to charge the battery and fill it. Um, the uh, payload, same thing. Uh, it's the ops people who are the, the critical ones. So the way we're doing that is the ops people, we've got a team of about seven or eight people doing ops. We're not the only project they're working on. So, and, um, and they like each other. So they're a cohesive <laughs> team. And uh, so what happens is a project manager is I go to their manager and say, you know, I'm really worried about making sure that they'll stay here and I can't afford to pay you for them to sit uh, and do nothing. So they're going to have to do other work, but what can we do to make sure we'll be able to get them back when we need them? Uh, so if you think about it, you know, they're, if they're working on two projects and they're spending half time on Sunrise and half time on Mars sample return or something else, then when the sunrise work ends at storage time, they'll go do half time on whatever they're working before and half time on some new project. And then a year from now, 
after, from then they'll come off of that and come back to sunrise. Um, and uh, and uh, of course our fond hope is is that they want to work together as a team, that they like the project. Everybody on the project is quite enthusiastic about it. it it's really cool. Um, I got a story from my project system engineer and uh, she had completely unrelated to this project or anything else, but like 10 years ago, she was working on a project and, and the scientists would say, you know, if only we had a way to do image radio imaging of the sun so we could understand this. And here it is, you know, 10 years later and she's working on sunrise and we're going to make radio images of the sun. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's what we do, but you know, we also have um, we have you know processes in place to train new people. Uh, there's a an interesting phrase, uh, you know, what is the bus factor of your project? And what that means is, how many people, if they were hit by a bus, could you tolerate <laughs> and still be successful? You know, and having a bus factor of one is pretty dicey, right? Um, so uh, we hopefully have a bus factor of like four or five. And, you know, and, and so if we lose someone, the other one is uh, the other nicer phrase than hitting, getting hit by buses, win the lottery. You know? <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, this billion dollar lottery last week, the winning ticket was sold about half a mile from JPL. And so everybody's <laughs> kind of looking at all the, well, who's not showing up to meetings anymore? <laughs> <laughs> who among the 5,000 people that work at JPL might have won that? Um, to be honest, even if I won the lottery, I'd still do this. Um, then that's true for most of the people at JPL. So yeah, you know, um, we will inevitably lose some people, but we'll have new people. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a interesting project. So it'll get support. We've got, um, we're going to build the first, uh, you know, this will be the largest, one of the largest telescopes ever built in space. And uh, maybe we're 10 kilometers right now. It, we're not real sensitive. With <laughs> the sun. Uh, but, you know, people want to build versions of Sunrise that have 100 or 200 spacecraft in it so they can look for these very same emissions coming from stars that are not the sun, like Proxima Centauri. And the other thing that this kind of instrument can detect is aurora. The aurora generates very strong emissions around one megahertz. Um, so if you can detect aurora around planets that are not around the sun, like Proxima Centauri or somewhere within 10 parsecs is the number they use, um, then you can't have aurora without a strong magnetic field and an atmosphere. So if you see aurora at another planet, that means that it has an atmosphere. Well, then that's potential for life. And the strong magnetic field means it's probably shielded from radiation, just like on Earth. I mean, Earth's magnetic field, Van Allen belt, lots of radiation out there, very little radiation on the surface. So atmosphere and, and magnetic field means high potential for life. So you can see why people want to look at that. And then if you want to get even weirder than that, and peer back to the very, very beginnings of the universe. Um, you've probably heard how redshift works, you know, that the things that are moving away from us, the frequencies are shifted down and red, right? And uh, uh, it turns out that, and the things that are farther away are moving faster and farther away by the time the light gets here means it's older. So, it turns out if you want to look at what the universe looked like right at its very beginning 10, 15 billion years ago, you're looking at signals coming from very far away that have been very much redshifted and the hydrogen emits very strongly at 1.4 gigahertz. That 1.4 gigahertz has been redshifted all the way down into the middle of the HF band. <laughs> um, so if you can see, so if you could build a telescope that could see that far down with enough resolution, then you can actually start to understand the very beginnings of the universe when it was, you know, after the Big Bang, there was this big cloud, and then it started to congeal into other things, you know, coalesce into galaxies and everything else. And they call that the cosmic dawn. And so um, there's a proposal out there now to build a big radio telescope on the far side of the moon 
to look at these frequencies. Um, I, as a person who builds flying spacecraft, I mean, I'm interested in that one too. I'm actually working on it, but um, yeah, imagine a hundred sunrises could probably do the same thing and um, doesn't have to deal with all the temperature fluctuations on the moon. Um, anyway, so yeah. Any other questions? Jim, I'd, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I'm retired and in the event I win the lotto, I'm going to stay retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do have a question regarding the antennas on the aircraft, um, the stacers, when they are pushed out, does it cause a, a tumbling of the, of the satellite? Well, they're, they're, um, they're all coiled up inside. Um, you, you know, those toys where you swing it and a, comes out and it's kind of like a spiral yes right that's what they are but doesn't that cause a you know some type of motion to the, the aircraft itself because oh when it comes out it causes yeah. a motion yeah right so what we do is we turn off the reaction wheels we fire them and then we turn the reaction wheels on and 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 balance okay. it all out it turns out it's a fairly small momentum change but it okay. is an issue and what what type of material are those stations made of uh, they're made out of uh, beryllium copper Okay. Spring, right. ordinary spring material, you know? And I see somebody's got a question here in, in the blue shirt on the window here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering when you're designing the radios, what what kinds of uh, parts and things are you sourcing for uh, that in that space environment? Oh, well, it turns out that, you know, a, a lot of parts are actually sufficiently radiation hard um, to do this. So the, you know, for the, CPU and stuff like that, we use parts that are radiation tolerant at the 20 kilorad kind of level, which is not special. The um, actual processor inside the payload is a uh, Xilinx uh, Zinc. And it's just a basic one. We've done some, we do some testing on the, well, Xilinx does some testing on them over temperature, but that's, but it's nothing special. Um, the analog circuitry is all just standard analog devices, op amps. Um, and, you know, one thing that's nice about this is that, you know, we're building basically a uh, HF receiver that, that's broadband. And so it has, you know, but we don't care about the DC bias. And so when you have radiation effects on op amps and things like that, you know, they make a small change in the gain well, we're interested in phase, so we really don't care about the gain as much. And uh, maybe the uh, bias, the DC offset changes. We started at 100 kilohertz, so we just filter that. You know, we have a <laughs> DC block in there. So the uh, radiation effects don't, af don't have much effect on us. And we're underneath um, a couple tenths of an inch of aluminum for shielding. Okay. So it is the... Uh... Is there a trade-off between the amount of software and the amount of hardware in the in the radio, space radios? There is. Um, you minimize the amount of hardware uh, because software is a lot easier to change. So, for instance, um, a lot of the CubeSats that went up on the Artemis mission are flying the Iris deep space radio. Um, that's entirely a software-defined radio. So the, the RF conversion part is and in fact actually so is the radio we're flying on sunrise from InnoFlight. Um, you know the there's a sort of a fairly conventional superhet conversion down to an IF and then they sample the IF with a fast A to D and then after that it's all digital. And that way you can control everything and change the filter bandwidths as you see fit and all that sort of thing. Can can you update uh, the the radio uh, when it's deployed? Yep. Yeah, the what the our payload we can um, we can update all the software in flight. Um, we actually have a test for that next April. Um, yeah, but the another question. Yeah, the uh, radiation you're concerned about is that gamma radiation or or what? Uh, charged particles mostly. Um, charged particles. So when you're up in geo, there's a huge number of protons and electrons. Um, the other thing we worry about is uh, cosmic rays, high energy. You know, because nothing shields a one giga electron volt cosmic ray is going to whip on right through the uh, shielding. And um, but fortunately, they're small, and yeah. so we have error correcting codes and everything else. We're not so worried about that. 
we did pick parts that aren't subject to latch up. Uh, yeah, but you're you're run of the. Oh, I think you're getting close to your end there. Um, yeah, so you know, uh, but it's charged particles is what we worry about. Thank you. Protons and electrons. Any other questions? Jim, when when they do the uh, the attitude adjustments, the attitude control, do you actually have to? Uh, give it a, a a small a short burst of of, uh, of propellant in one direction to start it, and then do a, an opposite reaction to stop That's it. A, just like flying in a plane, you start the turn, you stop the turn. Um, and uh, so, for small attitude controls, normally we we you just spin the wheel up or spin the wheel down, right? So if you spin the wheel up, it makes the thing spin. Then you spin the wheel down, and it stops. Um, but yes, and then eventually, of course, you you do the thrusters, and you have to start it and you stop it. That's all when done automatically, by the way. The little box in there has all the software in it. So what we do is say, point there. And <laughs> someone else has designed all those control laws. It's made life much easier. When, when the satellites are actually in operation, when they're fully deployed, how far are they going to be separated? Uh, Anywhere from one kilometers to 15 kilometers. Okay. I was, I, was, apart. I was thinking that they were much, much further apart. Nope. No, we have to we have to stay reasonably close because that sets the resolution. So if you get too far apart, then you get grading lobes and ambiguities. So there's a sort of a compromise. What's the lifespan of the uh, of the spacecraft once it's up in the space? Well. <clears throat> <laughs> The design life is 14 months. You know, it'll probably live longer, but there's a, you know, some per, small single digit percent chance of, you know, something going wrong. Uh, we don't worry much about micrometeorites, um, but, you know, you could, uh, there are known things that can occur that might cause a failure, but it's pretty rare. Um, but yeah, you know, 14 minutes. I mean, you know, after all, look at uh, Mars exploration rovers, right? Design life of 90 days, it's 90 sols, still trucking 10 years later, right? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the kind of the, the, the ultimate thing is we'd run out of propellant or the eventually the solar panels with time, they degrade and you eventually you'd run out of power. I think that's not even close to being a limit for us because... Um, we have a fair amount of excess power capacity and, and and we've got good thermal management. So we're not doing things. Um... Once you've satisfied the, the initial study of, of what it was designed for and they're up there, is there anything else that they can do? Oh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of suggestions and they'll <laughs> go hat in hand to NASA saying, gee, NASA, could we have an extended mission? Uh -huh. uh, um, Oh, it's funny, you know, they talk about this as well. Yeah, we can't do the sunrise mission after, you know, we have, we're down to three satellites, but there's this other whole other raft of things we could still do. So even if we start losing satellites along the way and it's five years later, you know, never say die. As long as you got money to run it, why not? You know, but at some point we're going to run out of propellant and then we just sort of drift. We're in what's called the geo graveyard orbit. So we don't have to try and deorbit. We just, we're space debris at that point. Yes, Claude. You said that you were going to do down the data downloads uh, once a week. That's right. How, how long does that actually take to download the data? Three what is it, hours. seven, eight, eight hours? Three, three, three hours. Three. And um, we allow five because um, and we actually do three of them at a time. So, because they're all close together, DSN points at one, it points at all. And um, DSN currently has the capability to receive signals from three satellites at a time. So that's how we'll do it. Uh, it, it I would love it if they had six at a time. But. Is there any issues with the amount of uh, bandwidth that the uh, DSM has for all yes. of these projects that are going on? Oh yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a big scheduling issue. You have to manage it. We are allocated 10 megahertz out of the 50 megahertz band for ours. 
So we actually have three signals all carefully slotted into 10 megahertz. And in fact, we actually can't do all six at the same time because um, the uh, two spacecraft are on, on the same channel. You know, there's three frequencies, six spacecraft. One spacecraft on each frequency is on left-hand pole and the other one's on right-hand pole. And so you could maybe do some polarization diversity and try and get all six. But in reality, we're just going to do uh, three at a time. Okay. Yeah. So on Saturday, we'll do the first three. And on Sunday, we do the second three. I mean, that, that's literally what our schedule is. And then on Monday through Friday, they process the data and get ready for next week. So... You have weekend satellite info. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weekend is weekend satellite info. All right. Any other last questions for Jim? No. Yeah, if you're interested in this whole multi-signal per aperture thing, uh, go look at DSN now. Just Google it, and it'll show up. It's a real-time display of what's going on at the Deep Space Network, and with all those satellites off Artemis, there's a bunch of activity going on. Um, you know, it, it's. Uh, Pretty cool. Um, so, and, uh, DSN now. Yeah, and um, it's part of Eyes on NASA. So it looks like right now, BioSentinel is downlinking through Canberra. And so, uh, and Capstone is downlinking through Madrid. So, um, yeah, you know, so come 2024, We'll be on that with our six spacecraft. Yay, we'll be paying yeah. attention. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, well, Jim, thank you very, thank very, you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. And we want to thank, thank you, you. Very much for sharing your program with a small group. Right. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me and I'll uh, be happy to do it. And I have your email address, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs>